So folks, what I have for you yet again tonight is another installment in one of the most legendary and hilarious stories of the dumbest team in history. And you have old Donnie on the one hand and his idiotic lawyers, his attorneys on the other, because what they've done and are doing and continue to do is absolutely baffling. And the fact that they think one, it's working and two, that they're going to get away with it absolutely absolutely boggles the mind because right now everything they're doing is leading to an epic faceplant. I got a clip to play for you. One where clearly even though Trump's lawyers aren't the best in the bunch, when they do give Trump something of decent advice, he just wholesale ignores it, putting himself and those lawyers into trouble and at the very least giving those lawyers big headaches. But also one of Trump's lawyers just did the dumbest thing ever. And and as a result, guys, more secret, hidden, concealed Trump communications and files are now in the hands of investigators whose objective is stopping Trump and taking him down forever. And it's all because of Trump's own dumb, dumb lawyers. Listen to this and then we'll break down this new story. With you on this and good to see you both. The January 6th committee, new report from Rolling Stone suggesting lawyers are having to convince Trump that, you know, don't do this deposition, how can they fight this? Well, it's an interesting question. For one thing, they can simply run the clock, as, as you've pointed out here. Um, but the, the question in front of the January 6th committee for any future witnesses, do you want to be Steve Bannon or do you want to be Mark Meadows? Do you mm. want to be Bannon, who does nothing to comply and gets prosecuted? Do you want to be Meadows, who turns over some documents and is able to get away with it? If Trump's lawyers are able to talk him out of testifying, certainly what they'll do is try to turn over some of the responsive documents so they at least have a good faith argument that they've tried to comply with the subpoena. You know, Hugo, last week the select committee interviewed former White House advisor Hope Hicks. And what kind of insights could she offer to this case for the Jan 6 committee? Yeah, Hope Hicks is a really interesting witness for the committee uh, because, if you recall, she came back to the Trump administration in the closing months before he left office. And the one thing that Hope Hicks told Trump repeatedly in the post-election period was he had lost. And he, uh, she effectively imparted that to him on multiple occasions, which is really important if you're trying to show that the former president knew that what he was saying about the election was false. And I think it only really adds a further quiver to the select committee's bow that they knew Trump had a guilty conscience when he was saying that uh, the, the election was stolen from him. Secret Service here, Hugo. Um, they're saying they're going to have more witnesses from the service. How did the agency at this point become such a focus of the investigation? Well, look, the Secret Service was with Trump and was also with Vice President Mike Pence on January 6th. And so they played very significant roles in the timeline and in the story of January 6th. And the Secret Service around Trump especially uh, is, is important because Trump was telling aides and Trump was telling the Secret Service detail he wanted to go to the Capitol. And the reason he wanted to go to the Capitol is unclear. And whether any concrete steps were taken for him to actually go to the Capitol, that's still being investigated. And that's really significant because if Trump ended up at the Capitol on the West Front that day, it's very, it's very significant and very interesting as to whether he might have tried to urge the crowd into the Capitol. What was he trying to do? That's the central question that the Senate can be trying to answer. Joyce, let's move to the New York tax fraud trial against the Trump Organization. That's set to begin tomorrow. What are you watching? Well, the CFO for the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg, has already pleaded guilty. And that should mean that the outcome of this trial is all over but the shouting. The, the testimony that the government needs to convict should be readily available to it. The big question surrounds what kind of Weisselberg will be. He has always tried to stay as uh, firmly tied to the former president as possible throughout this whole process, even to the point of going to prison on some charges rather than cooperating. But now that he has no Fifth Amendment right left to assert, the Manhattan DA will put him on the witness stand, will expect truthful testimony as a condition for executing on his plea agreement, which meant he served a far shorter sentence than he would serve if he were to take the witness stand and lie and lose the benefit of that plea agreement. So all eyes on him as we head into opening statements tomorrow morning.
So you can see here that that really lays out again how big how big of trouble he's in. And it's important because Trump's legal team is actually quite small and it's sort of intertwined. There are lawyers that are sort of dedicated to certain cases, but they're also kind of working as part of a big team. And they're also trying to manage the general strategy of Trump in this moment. And that's not siloed between one case. All of the cases have strategies. And what you're seeing is them overwhelmed and I think they're making mistakes and Donald Trump is making mistakes as well. I mean, just going back to July, even before the Mar-a-Lago search, Trump's lawyers were in court, you know, in New York saying, we need more time. We need you to, to, to delay some of these trials for us, please, because we literally don't have enough lawyers. Of course, it didn't work. And Trump was actually forced to, you know, take out his checkbook and gasp, pay for more lawyers. But the point is that they're already stretched thin. And what you saw just tonight was the result of that because you saw a couple days ago we've been covering it every step of the way the coup memo lawyer john eastman the guy that wrote that memo and has been trying to hide his trump communications lost his appeal in record time we covered that yesterday and was forced to surrender and he did some of those documents eight critical emails to the j6 committee but like an idiot he actually thought asking the J6 committee to pretty please not open the emails until he filed an appeal, until his appeal was formally filed. They just totally ignored him, guys. And so now, maybe maybe he didn't have to do it, but now because of the, the, the naivety of this guy trying to go in there and just give them something and saying, pretty please don't open it, the J6 committee has the secret eight emails they've been wanting for weeks, if not months. And even if there is an appeal, it won't matter anymore. I want to read you some reporting and a reaction when it says a new court filing from Trump's then attorney, John Eastman, disclosed that the House said it had accessed the emails on Friday. The House probe has been fighting for these records for months and a federal judge cleared the way for the committee to receive them in recent weeks, calling them possible evidence of the planning of crimes on Trump's behalf. Eastman had tried several last ditch attempts to hold off the committee, but the but it says the emails that the committee finally had accessed include four communications between Trump and attorneys that appear to indicate they, that they knew details submitted to courts to challenge the election results were false and four emails that reveal them discussing filing lawsuits as a way to hold off congressional certification of Trump's electoral loss, David Ju David Judge David O. Carter previously revealed. And so basically, these emails are now in the hands of committee. And if you read what following here, this is Cal Cheney, he's a great reporter on Twitter, when he says, Eastman says he sent the J6 committee a link to eight disputed emails and then asked them not to open it while his appeal was pending. The select committee said no appeal was legitimately pending and accessed the documents anyway, rendering his appeal mostly moot. So technically he can maybe appeal this and then you, his appeal says that he wants them to either return the emails or destroy them and, you know, destroy all copies and things like that if his appeal is successful. But these sort of appeals rarely work because one, the claims by the original judge are really strong. He makes a good case that there is likely, you know, probable cause here to determine that the crime fraud exception applies and attorney client privilege is therefore nullified, at least in part. And an appeals court is unlikely to challenge that. But further still, because it's moot, because the documents have already been accessed, because they've been handed over by a Trump lawyer, he just gave them to them saying, pretty please don't open it, which is not a legal barrier. Now a judge in appeals court is unlikely to overturn it. It's sort of like how there was an example a few months ago, actually going all the way back almost a year now where a Trump, you know, spokesperson had some of their bank records subpoenaed and taken as a result to see what the Trump and Trump staff were spending money on in the run up to J six. And he tried to fight that, but because it was too late, one of the reasons the courts went against him was that it was moot. And so the Trump lawyer here handing this stuff over, just giving it away to the J6 committee makes it almost impossible that they'll get these eight emails back and the committee likely already has them forever. And so Donald Trump has to be pissed. One of his lawyers gave up the documents in a way that makes it impossible to launch a real appeal. And also his lawyers probably aren't happy that they have to beg and plead him to take any sort of advice.